Today, it would be considered inhumane to transport people 14,000 kilometres from their homes for petty crimes like theft of clothing or the theft of a chicken. But in 18th century Britain, it became reality. In 1787, Britain sent approximately 770 criminals to the untamed and virtually unknown east coast of Australia. The reasoning for such drastic measures was to free up space in Britain's overcrowded prisons and to deter the increasing number of felons from committing more crimes and adding to the general state of immorality in London. A secondary purpose for sending the convicts and building a colony was access to timber to aid in shipbuilding for the Royal Navy. Most of the convicts had become city dwellers, resorting to a life of crime after they and their families were forced out of agricultural work by the rise of machine labour. They arrived in January 1788, initially calling at Botany Bay, where 18 years earlier James Cook and the Endeavour had landed. But the bay was far from ideal for settlement, and within eight days the first fleet anchored in Port Jackson to unload its human cargo. The convicts of the first fleet had been locked below deck for almost all of the 252 day journey total of 48 people perishing during the trip. Captain Arthur Phillip, the commander of the First Fleet, wrote that Port Jackson was the finest harbour in the world. But the convicts had little opportunity to enjoy the beauty of the harbour. They were far from home in a distant and barbarous country, unlikely to see family again. Early years of settlement were witness to much hardship as the colony of New South Wales teetered on the brink of starvation. Convict and Marine Court rations were reduced. It's little surprise that the first execution in Australian history was for the crime of taking away from the public stores beef and peas. Thomas Barrett was hanged on the 27th of February 1788, but theft from public stores wasn't exclusive to convicts. In 1789, six marines were hanged for theft of food and grog. The first murder occurred in May 1788, when William Oakey and Samuel Davis were speared by Aboriginal tribesmen while cutting back bushland. Oakey was found with three spears in him and his head split open. The British had hopes of working together with the various tribes. Hence, Governor Philip did little to pursue the murderers. Before departing from Britain, Philip was instructed to open an intercourse with the natives and to conciliate their affections, enjoining all our subjects to live in amity and kindness with them. Unfortunately, their methods of communication, which sometimes involved snatching individuals away from their local clans to learn more about them and their language, understandably irked the natives. The most cooperative of the Sydney Aboriginals was Benelong. Within a short time, he began to wear the clothes of the British and he enjoyed liquor as well. Benelong would often eat meals with Governor Philip at Government House. He became a mediator for Aboriginals and the settlers. This raised his status and his clan's status. Benelong is on record asserting that the British help him kill rival Pemelway, the leader of the Bidjigal clan. Unbeknownst to the British, they had walked in on a world of clan wars and ritual payback customs, including the right to exact vengeance on any relatives of supposed wrongdoers. This included infant children. Meanwhile, things had gotten so bad in the isolated colony that convicts and marines were walking around barefoot. In April 1790, the ailing colony was on the verge of starvation. Chief Surgeon John White penned a letter stating, They have forgotten us or neglected us. Otherwise, they would have sunk to see what had become of us. Help finally arrived in June 1790, when the second fleet arrived with much needed supplies. The ships straggled in sporadically. 
the disgraceful conditions on board led to 282 convicts dying during the voyage, while another 124 died during their first days in New South Wales. When Arthur Philip departed the governorship in 1792, his message to Britain was that the only way the colony would thrive would be through the arrival of farmers and emigrants who have been used to labour and who reap the fruits of their own labour. Over the next three years, under caretakers and during the rule of governors Hunter, Gidley King and Bly, the New South Wales corpse gained a stranglehold on the colony. The New South Wales Corps had first choice of any land allocated for settlement. They also gained first access to convicts that were available as assigned servants. The assignment system allowed for well-behaved convicts to work unpaid for a master until their sentence was completed. During the 1790s, interaction with Aboriginals became less friendly. The Aboriginal clans and tribes around Sydney began to see more whites as the settlements spread to Parramatta and the Hawkesbury River region. Rather than joining together in amity, the Aboriginals removed themselves. This can be reasonably attributed to the deadly smallpox plague of 1789, the loss of resources and their own xenophobia. Bidjigal man Pemelwoy rose to prominence after leading raids on farms around Parramatta. But there was never a combined movement between the clans and tribes of the Sydney area to expel the British. And attitudes toward the newcomers obviously differed. No doubt that historical intertribal warfare was a barrier against unified opposition to the British. Estimates claim that at the time of British arrival, there may have been 100,000 or up to 300,000 Aboriginal inhabitants of the continent, with hundreds of unique languages. Approximately 1,500 people arrived from Britain in 1788. They were virtually unopposed. Though the Aborigines didn't offer a combined resistance, military opposition was still a major fear for the colonists and it became a driver of much of the early exploration beyond Sydney. It was in 1798 that Matthew Flinders and George Bass circumnavigated Van Diemen's Land, confirming for the first time that it was in fact an island. Another Flinders voyage in 1802 made it official that New Holland and New South Wales were not separated by a gulf. It's during this time he met French explorer Nicolas Baudin at Encounter Bay. Soon after, they both headed back to Sydney to replenish. It was there that Governor Gidley King learned from discussions with Baudin that the French had been charting parts of Van Diemen's Land as far back as 1792. In order to thwart any French colonisation plans, the British established a settlement of 49 people at Risdon Cove in Tasmania on the 8th of September 1803. In doing so, they gained access to the whaling trade which was being opened up by intrepid American sailors. And in a bid to further strengthen the British claim to the continent, a settlement was established at Port Phillip Bay in October of the same year with 307 convicts and 49 free settlers. With security of the colony so tenuous, it's not surprising the British feared a convict uprising spurred by Irish Catholics. The Irish had convinced themselves that there was a conspiracy on board transport ships to starve and murder them. But there was material evidence for this distrust. 
The Irish Catholics weren't permitted to attend religious mass until 1803. In 1804, the Irish broke out on Sunday evening, burning homes and looting buildings for anything that could be used as a weapon. They found scythes, axes and even muskets. By midnight, Governor Philip Gidley King was informed of the rebellion of the croppies, and soon a squad of 52 New South Wales Corps troopers and four officers were dispatched. With martial law declared, Major George Johnson and the New South Wales Corps caught up with the rebels and thwarted their plans to overrun the colony and sail back to Ireland. It's said that up to 30 convicts were killed on March the 5th, 1804, with nine more hanged in the aftermath. Their bodies left to rot in public for months after the Battle of Vinegar Hill. In 1806, decision makers in Britain appointed William Bly as Governor of New South Wales, as they had done with all previous governors. Bly was famed as the Captain of the Bounty. He was a disciplinarian and he was tasked with bringing the New South Wales Corps into line. The Corps officers were of army background and every Governor of New South Wales had been a naval officer. This hardened attitudes of the New South Wales Corps. From the very beginning of his tenure, Bly clashed with John MacArthur. MacArthur had arrived in 1790 and worked as paymaster for the New South Wales Corps before resigning from his post in controversial circumstances to live as a free settler. When Governor Bly refused a 10,000 acre land grant that MacArthur was expecting, things deteriorated. Bly was also battling to regain control of trade through the ports and namely to end the use of rum as a form of payment. Things came to a head on 25th of January 1808 when MacArthur faced trial for not paying a fine related to his vessel. But MacArthur refused to be tried by Judge Richard Atkins, whom he claimed owed him money. When fellow court officers supported MacArthur, the judge fled to get assistance from Governor Bly. Bly demanded the officers attend court the next day on charges of treason. That didn't happen, as New South Wales Corps commander George Johnston led a march on the governor's residence on the 26th of January and removed him from his role as governor. A coup had been staged, and soon John MacArthur was free to go about his business with George Johnston, temporary leader of the colony. MacArthur was even appointed magistrate and secretary to the colony on February 12. Two years later, in 1810, the new governor, Lachlan Macquarie, arrived. He was a former army officer, but he wasn't going to allow things to continue as they were. The most immediate change was the New South Wales Corps officers all being recalled to Britain for their involvement in the 1808 coup. Macquarie brought his own regiment with him, so loyalty and adherence to duty were less a problem but Lachlan Macquarie is remembered most for his egalitarian streak. He was one of the original believers in convict emancipation. Macquarie set about an infrastructure spending spree which in time would frustrate his bosses in London. He ordered that all city streets be at least 15 metres wide and three Sydney buildings still stand today that were built under the rule of Governor Macquarie. They are the Mint, the Hyde Park Barracks and St James's Church. He also named many of Sydney's major streets that exist to this day, including George Street and Pitt Street. He also honoured former governors with street names like Philip, Hunter, King or Bly. And being a man that did not lack ego, Macquarie has a street for himself, as well as his wife. During his 11-year reign, Macquarie had the colony's first bank established in 1816. The Bank of New South Wales initially operated out of a premises leased by former convict Mary Raby. During the Macquarie era, first pick of skilled convict arrivals fell back into the hands of the government. This would put Macquarie at odds with some of the colony's most influential landowners. Macquarie lost the support of many free settlers when he had three of them flogged for trespassing on government domain. 
One of the colony's most prosperous landowners, Reverend Samuel Marsden, was furious that Macquarie had put a limit of 50 on the number of lashes magistrates could inflict on criminal offenders. Marsden also took issue at having to work alongside ex-convicts while co-director of the toll road to Parramatta. A decades-long battle of the classes was being fought, with many of the free settlers fighting to keep ex-convicts out of places of influence. Another major controversy during Macquarie's reign was the building of a new hospital that was completed in 1815. The governor had not followed protocol as he commenced building the hospital without obtaining permission from London. Additionally, the building contractors gained a monopoly over the import of rum as reward for building the hospital. Unsurprisingly, by 1820, the hospital underwent a major renovation due to its poor construction. Eventually, Macquarie grew tired of his critics, and he offered his resignation in 1818. But it was not until December 1821 that Governor Macquarie was replaced. The colony was now much more self-sufficient. Meanwhile, exploration was well underway. In 1824, Hamilton Hume and William Hovell trekked from Gunning to the Bass Strait to discover if there was more land suitable for farming. They completed their journey at Corio Bay near current day Geelong. The pair reported back their shock at finding white men camped along the southern coast. This should not have been, as the 1803 Port Phillip settlement had been abandoned within three months but small villages and lawless towns had been established by sealers and whalers without the knowledge of the colonial administration. Another explorer, Edmund Lockyer, who had explored the southwest of the continent, wrote about the same people two years later. From what I've learned and witnessed, they are a complete set of pirates. Along the southern coast of New Holland, from Rottnest Island to Bass's Strait, having their chief resort or den at Kangaroo Island. The itinerant pirates also had a reputation for carrying off Aboriginal women. By now, Morton Bay was up and running as another convict labour settlement. Morton Bay would originally be home to some of the colony's worst criminals, and just like the sadistic Norfolk Island and Van Diemen's Land settlements of Port Arthur and Macquarie Harbour, it became famed for its brutality. In the 1820s, Van Diemen's Land was a hotbed for clashes between black and white. Just like on the mainland, as the British settlers and convict labourers spread further inland, the indigenous resorted to violence in order to feed themselves. Sadly, violence continued to escalate, and the governor of Van Diemen's Land, George Arthur, was forced to declare martial law in the settled districts in 1828. With matters still not improving, Arthur instigated a levy en masse, or what is now labelled the Black Line. In 1830, three separate lines containing a total of approximately 2,200 settlers, ex-convicts and soldiers surged through the settled districts, hoping to isolate the remaining Aborigines and forcing them to live in the southeast of the island where they would be less capable of attacking settlers and they could be protected against outlaws. When the line discovered few existing Aboriginals, it was left to missionary George Robinson and a band including convict servants and Aboriginal guides to find and convince the last full-blooded Tasmanian Aboriginals to uproot and live on Flinders Island with promises of clothes, Bibles and schooling. Five years earlier, the place that would become known as Perth was being settled. 
Captain James Sterling had met with French navigator Jules Dumont d'Urville in Sydney in 1826 and was shown charts of the Swan River area. Sterling advised New South Wales Governor Darling that Swan River should become a garrison or settlement. The government acquiesced, but when London heard from their embassy in Paris that the French had designs on a settlement in New Holland, the order was given to establish a British settlement at the Swan River. The British arrived on 2nd of May 1829 with orders to secure for Britain all those parts of New Holland not included in New South Wales. The Swan River colony was developed by private backers Thomas Peel, a young English landowner, and Solomon Levy, an ex-convict turned merchant banker of Jewish descent. As opposed to previous settlements, the Swan River colony was initially established without the aid of convicts. In 1834, farmer Edward Henty, frustrated with inaction from the Governor of New South Wales, took it upon himself to sail from Van Diemen's Land to farm on the mainland. It wasn't long before others followed. Soon, John Batman arrived, and in June of 1835, he had bartered with natives to purchase 60,000 acres of land using gifts of knives, tomahawks, scissors, clothing, and flour. Two days later, he rowed a small boat up the Yarra River and decided to settle in the area that is now called Melbourne. During the first months of Batman's settlement, some of his team made a startling discovery they stumbled upon a white man roaming the bush on his own. That man was William Buckley, an escaped convict from the failed settlement of Western Port in 1803. Buckley had been living with the Aborigines of the Wataurong tribe for more than 30 years. The ex-convict told of initially being warmly welcomed as the white ghost of a recently expired tribesman. Buckley was able to marry one of the women of the tribe before jealousy caused other members to kill her. The wild bushman claimed he had seen whites in the Port Phillip area regularly, but only found the courage to approach them in 1835 when he had overheard members of a tribe plotting to rob a visiting ship and kill the crew. Back in Sydney town, radical notions of equality were taking their first tenuous roots. Though successive governors Brisbane and Darling were directed to ensure that British and Irish criminals would fear transportation to Australia, many convicts who gained their freedom during the Macquarie era and before had seeped into positions of influence. There was Simeon Lord, an ex-con who became wealthy through the spirits and sealing trades before becoming a magistrate. Francis Greenway was sentenced to 14 years transportation to Australia for forgery, but Governor Macquarie had learned of Greenway's skills as an architect and assigned him the role of civil architect and assistant engineer for the government. Greenway was granted living quarters for he and his family before receiving a pardon in 1817, 10 years before his scheduled release. Another convict who had defied class distinctions was William Redfern, who was transported for mutiny while in the Royal Navy. His skills as a surgeon saw him make friends on both sides of the class war, and his report in 1815 led to vast improvements on board convict transport ships. But when Redfern was given the post of magistrate by Governor Macquarie, class tensions were heightened. By the 1830s, New South Wales had its own generation of native-born residents, and those who were children of convicts were still fighting class distinctions as the stain of convictry did not disappear in a single generation. Perhaps the most famed of the early emancipists was William Wentworth. Wentworth worked as a barrister, but enlisted the aid of lawyer Robert Wardell to establish New South Wales' first unregulated newspaper the Australian in 1824. A cultural and political war was waged in Sydney during the 1830s, with major players being the Exclusives and the Emancipists. The Emancipists were supported by currency lads, while somewhere in between the Exclusives and the Emancipists were the Specials. The major issues being self-government, the right to vote 
and an end to convict transportation. From 1824, New South Wales had its own legislative council of five councillors chosen by the governor on behalf of the king. But actions of the Chartist movement in England influenced lawmakers of the time and by 1842, the New South Wales Constitution Act was passed allowing for an elected legislative council to exist. In 1843, New South Wales's first election was held, but the election was nothing like the kind we know of now. When the right to vote arrived in 1843, there were restrictions on who could vote and who could run for Parliament. The laws stated that only men over the age of 20 who owned property valued at more than £200, or those that occupied a property with rent of more than £20 a year. Those that wanted to actually become members of the Legislative Council had to show possession of £2,000 of capital or earn an income of £100 a year. With a population of 160,000, approximately 10,000 people were eligible to vote for just 24 of the 36 members of the Legislative Council. The remaining 12 were chosen by the Governor. Three years earlier, in 1840, another major breakthrough had occurred, with convict transportation to New South Wales being brought to an official end. Though momentum was with those seeking to end transportation and remove the stigma of convictism attached to New South Wales, there were still some free settlers who supported transportation as they benefited from the free labour of convicts. The 1830s was a decade in which frontier conflict increased in New South Wales. While some Aborigines continued to live as fringe members of Sydney's new society, many that did have contact with whites were stupefied by alcohol and suffering from diseases like syphilis. Though early governors wanted to see the Aboriginals accept and convert to Christianity, it rarely happened. Even Lachlan Macquarie failed in his open-armed attempt to bring the natives into the new society. But the hunting and gathering skills of the Aborigines were put to use by the New South Wales government. In the early penal colonies of Newcastle and Moreton Bay, Aboriginals earned a reputation as ruthless trackers that could hunt down escaped convicts and earn payment for their services. If Van Diemen's Land and the Black Line was not the low point of black and white relations in Australia, Mile Creek was. In 1838, a group of 12 convicts and ex-convicts who felt aggrieved over the theft and destruction of their cattle took bloody vengeance on a clan of 28 men, women and children. The murderers roped up the unarmed group before shooting and slashing them to death. The corpses were later burned on a pyre. Justice was eventually served with seven of the twelve hanging for their crimes. Australia's financial fortunes changed in 1851 when significant gold was found in Ophir near Bathurst. The find was officially made by Edward Hargraves who had returned to Australia after an unsuccessful time in the California gold rush. Once news filtered through the colonies, much of the working male population fled the cities and headed for the goldfields. This caused much dismay as landowners and shopkeepers lost their staff. Men rushed to Bathurst and Ballarat. The gold rush also caused a sudden burst in immigration with an influx of free English and Irish arriving. It was not until 1854 that Chinese began arriving in vast numbers as well. Prior to 1854, Chinese had migrated in dribs and drabs filling holes as free convict labour was winding down in the various colonies. 
But in 1851, there was trouble on the horizon, as colonial governments sought to profit from the gold boom. A miner's license fee was created, and at 30 shillings a month, it was more than most could afford to pay. Some miners could never afford the license, but still tracked to the gold fields. In response, local police made regular license hunting raids. If any man was found on the fields without a license, they would be fined six pounds. If it was a second offence, the individual could be jailed. The law also allowed for informants and prosecutors to get half of the six pound penalty, leading to overzealous policing of the gold fields. By 1854, the Ballarat Reform League had been formed, and at a meeting of around 10,000 miners and residents at Bakery Hill, those present supported a charter whose principles went beyond the mining tax and touched on the kind of democratic values that had roots in the Chartist movement of the UK and American-style liberty. The Reform League also demanded total abolition of the diggers and storekeepers license tax. Though League members J.B. Humphrey, George Black and Thomas Kennedy met with Victorian Governor Charles Hutham on 27th of November, no progress was made. When the leaders of the Reform League returned to Ballarat, a resolution was made that, in the event of any party being arrested for having no licence, that the United People will, under the circumstances, defend and protect them. Soon after, Gold Commissioner Robert Reid ordered another licence hunt on Thursday, 30th of November. When police arrived, they were stoned into an embarrassing retreat. The miners then marched to Bakery Hill and assembled in numbers of up to 1,500. By Saturday evening, with a quasi-fortress built, now known as the Eureka Stockade, Peter Lawler, an Irish man who'd been in Australia only two years but was a leader amongst the rebels, organised the building of the stockade and procurement of arms and ammunition. But government spies had infiltrated the Ballarat Reform League. And at 3am on Sunday morning, police and troops attacked the stockade while it was undermanned. The government forces of up to 300 quickly overran the rebels in the fort as the 150-odd who remained were caught by surprise and disorganised. Reports tell of 22 miners being killed and seven of the government forces dying also. Though the government won the battle, public opinion was even more in favour of the miners, and their demands for reform were soon met. By November of 1855, Victoria's new constitution allowed those in possession of a miner's licence to vote in elections. During this remarkable decade, communication between colonies by telegraph transformed the nation. Melbourne was first in 1853 with a line between Melbourne and Williamstown. In 1857, Hobart was connected to Launceston. Meanwhile, the first railway line in Australia was built and used in Victoria in 1854. New South Wales soon had a railway line connecting Sydney to Parramatta with its inaugural usage 26th of September 1855. South Australia was next with a line from Adelaide to Port Adelaide in 1856. Frustratingly, the colonies used varying gauge sizes for the railway lines and this provides an example of how partisan idiocy and ignorance can damage the future prosperity of a nation. Around the same time, an influx of Chinese immigration was becoming a source for dispute on the gold fields. The majority of the Chinese were men, and records say that in 1861 of the Chinese-born population, just 11 were women, while 38,337 were men. This fueled rumours that sodomy was being practised by many of the Chinese. The men were predominantly on contracts for wealthy Chinese in the homeland, and once their debts were paid, the majority returned home after mining Australia's gold deposits. Their strange pigtail hairstyles, bizarre clothing, inability to communicate in English, and the opium epidemic they brought made them an easy target. On top of that, the Chinese who travelled and worked in numbers of 30 to 100 had a good deal of success on the gold fields, and this irked locals even more. 
Newspaper reports throughout the 1850s regularly warned of the likelihood of violence if conditions didn't change. In 1855, the government of Victoria was forced to act and set as policy the Chinese Immigration Restriction Act. The policy required all Chinese arriving at Victorian ports to pay a £10 fee. But profiteering shipmasters got around the tax by dropping their human cargo in South Australia. The Chinese then made the long journey overland to the Victorian goldfields. Eventually the public took matters into their own hands, driving Chinese off the Ararat and Buckland River goldfields in 1857. By November of that year, the colony of South Australia also approved a policy of £10 fees for Chinese arriving at their ports. In 1861, after the infamous Lambing Flat riots in New South Wales where Chinese gold diggers were violently attacked, reactionary laws were passed to restrict Chinese immigration. Though attitudes towards convict transportation were more and more negative, the departure of the labour force from established cities did stir up some conflicting attitudes. Western Australia finally began receiving convicts in 1850 and received its last deposit of 229 convicts on the 10th of January 1868. This ended all transportation to Australia of convicts from the UK. Over the ensuing decades, Australians made a habit of trying to hide any family links to convictry as the stain carried with it suspicions of light-fingeredness, a propensity toward homosexuality and the reputation for laziness. In 1868, Australia's first royal visit was marred by an assassination attempt on Prince Alfred. Irishman Henry O'Farrell shot the prince in the back in the Sydney suburb of Clontarf. Fortunately, the wound was not serious. O'Farrell, who it was claimed was mentally unstable, was executed months later. But the incident was an example of the simmering tensions between Catholics and non-Catholics. As a result, a new law was passed known as the Treason Felony Act, which made it an offence to not drink to the health of the Queen. By the 1870s, education had finally become compulsory and free. During these pioneering years of the public school system, children were only required to attend up to the age of 13, and those who continued to study in a high school were often required to pay school fees. Government assistance for religiously affiliated schools was completely abolished across the colonies. The more centralised education system aimed to improve results and efficiency. Prior to the changes, a large percentage of children only attended dame schools, which were effectively a pre-modern childcare centre with a neighbourhood citizen giving very basic instruction in literacy, with no groupings of children into respective grades. In 1871, direct telegraph communication with Britain was in the pipeline after a submarine cable was laid between Java and Darwin. The first direct message from the UK to the Australian continent travelled from London to Adelaide on the 22nd of October 1872. Australia's wildest and most infamous gold rush began in 1873 on the Palmer River in North Queensland. Deposits of gold had already been found in parts of Queensland, but the Palmer River region was virtually untouched land inhabited by tribes with cannibal tendencies. Cooktown became a booming port with diggers arriving there before making the dangerous trek to the Palmer River goldfields. Unlike the southern regions, there are few examples of the Aboriginal tribes of this area being welcoming of the new inhabitants on the continent. Queensland had already experienced the Hornet Bank Massacre of 11 whites in 1857 and the Cullen Laringo Massacre of 19 whites in 1861. The savage actions of tribes further north were no surprise. The diggings themselves were rarely attacked by the tribesmen, for they had learnt in 1874 at Battle Camp that attacking large groups resulted in mass casualties for them. 
So it was that whenever whites or Chinese travelled in small groups from Cooktown across the Laura River to Normanby River, they became targets for Aboriginal aggression. But retribution at the hands of the whites was bloody. One such example came after a gruesome attack on a German family. Johann Strau was speared to death before his wife was raped and mutilated. Their infant daughter was found with her stomach ripped open. Another provocative attack by the Aboriginals was the killing and cannibal devouring of the Macquarie brothers. The result was carnage on the Normanby River. Using native police, Sub-Inspector Douglas scoured the plateau and shot every black fellow they could find. But the Aboriginals went on killing men and killing horses. A rumour even circulated that they had a preference for Chinese flesh, as many more Chinese fell victim to the natives. Nevertheless, the Chinese ran afoul of the whites too, and in 1877 the colony of Queensland imposed a £10 poll tax on Chinese immigrants. By 1878, racial violence erupted in Maytown, with multiple deaths reported. Throughout the 1870s, religious tensions were boiling in Sydney between Protestants and Catholics. The assassination attempt on Prince Alfred was further fuel for the fire. In one particular display in 1875, 10,000 Protestants and Orange men marched at the opening of a new Protestant hall. The late 1870s and 1880s were also a terrible era for law enforcement, with the Kelly Gang's reign of terror commencing in 1878. The gang was finally cornered at Glen Rowan in 1880. Ned Kelly, with his suit of armour, the only rebel survivor of a police barrage. He was hanged in November that year. In 1881, intercolonial meetings were becoming a regular occurrence, and it was in January of that year when leaders of Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia passed legislation restricting Chinese immigration again. The 1880s also saw an increased awareness of the continent's poorly defended borders. Reports from members of Britain's Royal Engineers highlighted the weaknesses. In 1884, German territory in northeastern New Guinea was extended. This occurred on the back of a visit to Australia by the Russian Navy in 1882. Governments in all colonies became nervous. And the expansionist efforts of these European powers were a major driver of the calls for federation. In addition to defence, Federation would assist in coordination of postal, telegraphic and rail services. But Federation found opposition. Each colony had been collecting revenue by way of tariffs on goods from neighbouring colonies, and protectionists opposed removal of tariffs as such a move would expose them to more competition. The 1880s and into the early 1890s were witness to a rise in labour union movement, with persistent calls for higher wages and reduced hours. Maritime unions and shearers unions were amongst the most vociferous and violent. A slowdown in economic activity coincided with a banking collapse, and in 1893 numerous banks failed or suspended payments. Unsurprisingly, the Federation movement would lose a good deal of momentum during this period.